Thank you very much, Christian. Yes, so starting with a not pen announcement, we have three more sessions prepared for you, and I promise you it's going to be worth sticking around for all three of them. And then, of course, like I promised, drinks after, so that's definitely worth sticking around for. So our next session is going to focus on the topic of watching back. What are our strategies of resistance? What can we do in face of this overwhelming mass surveillance that we have been discussing the whole morning? And uh, I have four fabulous panelists that I would like to ask uh, them to join me on stage now. That is uh, Mark Tachinsky from the Tactical Technology Collective. And do you want to take the, like, or this one? Just like, this. Andreas Lehner, also Digitale Gesellschaft. Um, please re-welcome Gillian York from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And last but not least, Katarzyna Szymelewicz. I've just realized I've never said your last name before. I hope that was right, Katarzyna, from the Panopticon Foundation. So um, just to start the session off with, I wanted to share with you a little story that I just learned yesterday, so I'm afraid I'm not going to be a super expert in reciting this, but in one of the sessions that we had, and it's kind of this bar camp style setting that we had with a group of activists and researchers we've invited, somebody shared this story, um, which is definitely one strategy of watching back. Uh, it's the project of a newspaper in Switzerland called the WOZ that decided to turn the tables on the head of their secret service, Marcus Sun and in reaction to the uh, surveillance being conducted in their country and his outspokenness over the, um, um, the justification of surveying his, 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 the citizens of Switzerland, um, they decided to watch him back and through all legal means that were possible, crawled the net for information on Marcus Seiler and created this little website, and maybe you can scroll down quickly, that shares all kind of information that is publicly available about him on his net, uh, on the net, which includes um, the church that he belongs to, the office that he works in, the career that he's had, and just, just shows to uh, share this information with the general public um, to make him feel what it's like to be watched. Um, I've tried to read up on it really quickly. It's hugely entertaining. I recommend you check this out on your own, and maybe we can use this as one kick off it's definitely like I said I think one uh, strategy so uh, I would like to start with uh, giving my panelists the opportunity to introduce themselves and especially the organizations that they represent a little bit more to give an idea of the variety of NGO civil society activists and organizations that are out there trying to change the system that we're facing at the moment both by um, by doing advocacy work, by lobbying governments, by educating and mobilizing citizens and offering um, very practical tools for people to use to protect themselves. So maybe we can do one round over the panel and maybe Marek, you can begin and explain to us what does Tactical Technology Collective do? Hi, hi everybody, my name is Marek and I'm from Tactical Technology Collective. And in short, uh, we, we work in three areas. So uh, forget now for a second about uh, Snowden if you can. Um, uh, uh, we work with uh, technology and we look at technology and information, how that technology and information as it is can be used to look into issues like transparency, accountability and rights and how it can advance all of them or how it can set them back. And now get back to Snowden. Uh, uh, we work in uh, two other areas. One is the uh, data politics, which is looking at, at the issue of uh, uh, autonomy of the political actor, which I can uh, explore later. Um, we look at what digital shadows and traces we all leave behind and what uh, political meaning that has uh, and uh, how we should look into that. And the last area is called, of our work, digital security, which is purely looking at uh, what are the tools and tactics that we can use in the digital realm to enable, again, privacy, which I can also talk more about later. So those are the three areas. It's 27 people now. We have an office in Berlin, so you can meet us physically. Some people are here in the room as well, and even some board members are here. 
Gina, what does the Panopticon Foundation do? What have you been specifically doing also the last half year on, on this topic? All right, and in one minute, you say, um, well, Panopticon is a small thing, uh, nothing comparable to tactical tech, uh, which I know from inside as a board member. Um, we have seven people founded four years ago uh, with this concept of, well, confronting surveillance, uh, but confronting on many, many levels because we started this in Poland, um, where basically the topic was not existent, so nobody even thought of surveillance as an issue. So we thought, so we thought of, of first uh, investigating what surveillance really is now, what surveillance society means in Poland, in Europe, uh, where it hasn't been researched so much yet, uh, then naming the problems and monitoring them to react to them. And our reactions uh, were basically on three levels as well. Uh, so first was law. Most of us are lawyers, so we chose to look at the legislative processes to see where the bad laws come, uh, come up that enable more surveillance or the, the very bad, massive, uncontrolled surveillance. Uh, obviously, then we react to them if we see them. Uh, then we thought of being public advocate and proposing alternatives if we see alternatives. Uh, so somehow we do also lobbying and we sometimes draft amendments, we draft uh, new laws, we propose our other solutions. But we also work with people directly doing education, awareness raising, a lot of media work. Um, and unfortunately for us, it's soon, uh, we soon discovered that everything happens in Brussels, so it's not really possible to be a Polish human rights watchdog like working on surveillance. We have to be European one because Brussels imposes many surveillance practices and legislation, so more and more we do work on the European uh, level. And obviously last six months for us was uh, Snowden related, <laughs> so to say. Uh, on the top of our, other, our other, other pending projects, we were trying to struggle for some legislative changes and some strong political reactions in the EU and in Poland, but maybe I can talk about that in my first intervention so I don't take more time now. Okay, thank you. Pass the mics. Thank you. The EFF. Uh, so, um, as you might know, we're the folks suing the NSA. Um, but that's a part of our domestic work where we work on a lot of issues around privacy, free speech, intellectual property. Um, we also do a lot of work internationally, and that's where my role is, so you won't find me talking as much about our domestic work um, on this panel. Um, but internationally, we've been working on the, um, the 13 principles for the application of human rights uh, to communication surveillance. Um, we also do a lot of advocacy and support of groups in other countries um, all over the world, but particularly Latin America and the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and then we're also um, in the business of building uh, secure technologies and training and um, uh, creating, what do you call them, sort of modules or guides around how to, uh, how to be more secure online. So kind of a whole uh, assembly of things. And if you say you work globally, like, but you're based in the US, how does it work? <laughs> so um, I spend most of my time on airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> So I work with the Digitale Gesellschaft that you might have previously heard of today, I assume, which basically tries to influence the German domestic policy making and educate the general public. And in another capacity, I work with the Chaos Computer Club, which is a bunch of hackers and we're both trying to educate the public and provide technology to people as digital self-defense, which is, I assume, something we're going to talk about later on too. Thanks. So. Um we have spoken a lot today and we keep hearing this, you know, it's, you know, it's so overwhelming and um, as Judith was saying on the panel previously, she's written all these articles despite people not wanting to read them over the past half year and how hard it has been to get the message out there and to make people care. Now, when things uh, started in the summer, I'm sure a lot of us felt um, not just the, um, yeah, being overwhelmed with all the information that was coming out, but also a relief because a lot of us now, you know, we know that we're not all crazy people and working with crazy people, but have a whole new lease of our, yeah, um, argumentation at hand of why, uh, why things should change and felt that this could kind of be a game changer. But in fact, a lot of reactions that we've had from the governments that we're trying to lobby is let's have more surveillance to counter surveillance. So um, I would like to hear from you how, uh, you know, A, do you agree? How do you feel about that? What have your efforts to reach people and mobilize people have been like over the last months? What has actually worked? 
Right, yes. Um, I have said it before that six months ago I, re I was really hoping for a game changer and uh, many, many factors around us, especially the public debate, you know, I mean, I don't have to tell you what happened in the public debate six months ago. Uh, it was optimistic. We, we felt that under that immense pressure, the governments and the European politicians will simply not be able to, to ignore the problem for long, long for, for even longer than they did, uh, especially that, as you said, uh, we have been explaining that stuff for so long, so long, that everything that was left was say, see, so we are right, and now we expect your reactions, immediate reactions. And that was six months ago. Therefore, uh, me and many other friends uh, uh, from the network started doing some quick, rapid movements around the topic, hoping that we can get uh, political responses. Uh, and what we got was basically a lot of, um, a lot of uh, promises. And some of these promises, they, were, uh, they had a deadline until the end of the year, and now there would be the time for delivery. Uh, I mean especially European uh, politics, where the commissioner, um, Vivian Redding, responsible for, for fundamental rights, and her colleague responsible for uh, home affairs, Cecilia Malmström, promised uh, very concrete stuff. We were talking about freezing, freezing uh, current trade agreement, uh, TTIP, I'm sure many of you are aware of that process, before um, U.S. explains the issue. We were talking about serious investigation going on in Brussels to find out really what these programs were about and how they affected uh, fundamental rights in the European Union. We were talking about uh, quickly negotiating new umbrella agreement for exchange of data connected to judicial matters and police cooperation. We were talking about revising existing agreements on exchange of data like SWIFT, PNR. It was a bunch of issues and a lot of work done uh, around uh, rising them and making them very concrete. And then uh, around uh, one week ago, we had the first uh, set of communications, that, that's how it's called formally, from the European Commission, uh, which was the, the response. And you will not be surprised that the response was uh, far more vague and far more diplomatic than anybody could have imagined six months ago. The, the basic theme coming back in these communications was, we have to rebuild trust, but we have to rebuild trust as if European Union or us here were responsible for breaching the trust same way that USA or, uh, or NSA w were responsible. So it was quite ridiculous and European Union seriously got to the job of rebuilding trust as the first objective. Why? Because of trade, economic relationships and, uh, and the crisis. So again, another threat, not terrorism yet, although they keep mentioning of it, of course, uh, was used to, to, to block our human rights related concerns, saying, no, 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 human rights, they have to wait. They cannot uh, go into conflict with trade so much. Trade now is more important. And it's very clear that that will be the policy of the European Union for the next uh, one year before the elections. After the elections, we shall see, but I'm only afraid that the elections will bring more uh, right-wing politicians who are either anti-EU or pro-national uh, security. So I, I will not be optimistic about uh, governments and politics. We also tried a different strategy, uh, meaning transparency. We thought, okay, we cannot get immediate response with the legislations, but maybe we can get more information about what is going on. I think I thought as a citizen and activist that they basically owe it to us. Uh, so we asked as an organization 100 questions using freedom of, of information law to our government, to various branches of the government and secret services. They were extremely detailed questions, not just the general stuff, but exactly who you met, if you met that person, what was the, the conversation about, what were the documents. We knew about many documents, we knew about many meetings, so it was all based on facts. And now we are receiving first responses to these questions. And essentially I can tell you that either our government has learned about mass surveillance programs for The Guardian, or they are lying to us. Uh, so it's another gloomy picture. We, of course, we will go to court. Somebody before mentioned that we should, journalists and activists should work together with FOIA requests and uh, go to court. We will do it, but it will take maybe two, three years more to get that fight for information. And we are still, as many of you said, uh, fucked up now with this. So uh, what do we do next? Um, 
well, our idea is that we have to work with people because obviously without a very strong public demand, politicians will continue what they've been doing for last years. Companies will continue what they've been doing. That was another, another front, so to say, where we hoped for change. We hope that people will leave Facebooks, Googles and the likes and move maybe to so-called European cloud at least and preferably to diaspora and, uh, and organizations we trust. But nothing like that really happened. There, there were small moves and also Facebooks and the Googles, they didn't change their policies at all. And they didn't even lose on the, on the stock market. So that's a very concerning thing. Uh, so my, well, my argument to take forward in our discussion would be how to work with people uh, on three levels, I would say. First, to explain them what the, re the issue really is about. Uh, kill, finally, the argument, nothing to hide. It has nothing to do with privacy, really. I mean, why we keep using privacy as the main value? It's not about privacy. It really is about our freedom and about our, our autonomy. And it really... Uh, and it, it totally is about power relations. They use our data not to show that we are naked, but to control us. And if we are not able to explain this to people, we, we will keep losing that fight. And the second step for me would be to move to emotions and, and feelings and to, to move people uh, as human beings. Because we, we, you know, we have a lot of information, we have a lot of data, Snowden helps us, uh, media helps us, but people just see more and more data, more and more expert knowledge coming up, but they don't feel emotions. We need to show the, the suffering, the harm, the real human beings being hurt by surveillance so that they uh, identify themselves with these victims. And finally, then we can show alternatives and be hopeful that they will use these alternatives. So that will be my action plan. Thank you. That was a lot already. I think you touched on, yes, I think, Russell, of course. It's actually like a mini keynote for the panel because I think there was a lot of issues in there that we will hopefully be discussing during the course of the next hour and it also should kind of show that we are talking about uh, resistance or alternatives along a time scale here. There are things that are within the scope of immediate action and there are things that will take time and we should look at longer down the line like what is the vision of the world that we actually want to live in. So maybe we can um, see how we can discuss different of those shorter and long-term solutions. And I think one of the uh, key points that you touched when you spoke about the reaction from the EU um, being one that shows that um, economy is, is the focus of, and I'd say that translates very well into Germany as well, because if we look at the outcome of our election result, results, I would dare say that it's not that people don't care about these issues, but they care about their personal economic well-being first, and that translated in our election as results, which kind of, you know, raises the very fundamental question that was raised by somebody in the audience earlier. Are we, you know, interested in living in a democracy or in a functioning um, capitalist system? Really. So <laughs> there is a big arc there. But bringing it back to the question, you know, what, what have, how has this perhaps impacted it on our work and has changed the work that we've been doing on the topic of uh, digital security and surveillance over the last uh, years during the last six months? Has your work changed over the last six months? Yeah, so I think that when the revelations hit, I was probably, I was either in Europe or the Middle East, I can't remember, and I got home the next day and I went into the office, and you know, you heard a lot of, like, I'd seen a lot of people on Twitter already saying, like, oh yeah, we're not surprised about this, and so I figured I would come into my office at EFF, where, you know, we've, we, were, we started suing the NSA in, in the early 2000s, so this was not new to us completely, but I got into the office that day and everyone was really torn up really freaked out and actually surprised. And I think that that's a really important point because if anybody knows this stuff, it's the lawyers that I work with. And so, <laughs> uh, so basically, what's changed? I mean, again, like I said, I can't speak as much or as, very, as well um, to our work in the US, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, but overall, as an organization, I think that we've really come to realize that we need to tackle this from multiple different angles. And what I mean by that is, there's been this debate over the past couple of years, which, which is really the solution, technology or policy, technology or policy, and the truth is, it's technology and it's policy, and it's educating and changing society for the longer term. So we think about some of these digital security solutions, and I'm, I obviously am a huge proponent of them, and I believe in them and want everyone to use encryption for the sake of everyone else, but at the same time, you know, I come from a background of working on censorship issues, and, I've always made the argument that circumvention tools are really just a band-aid on a really big problem. Uh, circumvention technology, sorry. Um, 
And so when it comes to this, you know, I think that, of course, yes, we should absolutely encrypt our data no matter what, but is this the world that we want to live in where we're constantly fighting back as a small, you know, almost meaningless counterpower to the state and to the capitalist society? And I think that a lot of the solutions that we're coming up with right now are in fact short term. And so I'm not saying let's not do policy, let's forget policy entirely and focus entirely on encryption or entirely on this, but rather, yes, let's look at these short term solutions, let's find ways to shift policy where we can, let's encrypt our data, but let's also think about what the next generation will be able to accomplish. Because if we keep the political system, and I guess now I am thinking about the US, if we keep the political system that we have intact, this will never change. And again, let's keep that in mind for the broader discussion that we we'll hopefully have here. Um, Cassia, um, yeah, <laughs> basically, uh, Cassia said explaining the issue is at uh, is the top priority um, reaching people. Um, that's very much what the Tactical Technology Collective does on different levels. Would you say you're on a very long-term mission to educate people so there can be that kind of counterpower? somewhere in the future? It's funny, if you, if you knew my friends, it would tell you that if you try to frame the answer in the question, I won't answer it. Uh, <clears throat> we are not educational organizations, so we're not trying to explain anything to anybody or train people in anything that would assume that we know better uh, something than anybody in the room knows. We try to aggregate certain things. But I would like to answer the question in the context of what you were saying, both of you. Uh, the, the reaction to what happened is, is quite inter interesting because um, within our network and ourselves, I think um, what we observe is a, is a certain loss that happened. And with the loss, you have you know, grievance, you have uh, denial, you have you know, panic, and you have certain loneliness in, in, in it as well. So we're trying to figure out, and you have tendencies where uh, people are trying to find immediate alternatives that would solve the problem not even naming the problem per se. On the other hand, people saying that nothing happened, we knew it, it was known. You know, if you grew up in East Germany or Poland as myself, uh, there's not a surprise that state is trying to gain as much as they can within any framework uh, in case somebody may be in the position of counter power at some point and so on. Um, so, so the reaction is, is, is kind of interesting, but we also ask a lot of questions about frameworks and methodologies used by us and other organizations that is EFF or Panopticon and so on, where we're coming from certain premise and beliefs, if you like, in the concepts of state or different ideas and so on. And we're trying to look at them uh, differently. And the questions are like, if one of 400,000 people who have access to the uh, information, Snowden, uh, decide to reveal that information. Who are the other 400,000 clone troopers that didn't make this decision and, and why? And now they also exist in the environment with other institutions, organizations that historically were trying to work out a system that wouldn't allow this level of secrecy by whatever powers. However, uh, they're good at it, they're extremely good at it. Uh, better than anybody here, and they will be better at it. And uh, probably another Snowden won't happen soon. Uh, and if happen in this environment, uh, may not happen in China, may not happen in other places, or the treatment of that person uh, and uh, their actions will be different. So coming back to your question <laughs> now, if this funny statement in a way, um, is that um, it changed a lot of our work and in, in terms of demand for uh, alternatives as if they were alternatives and, and they are alternatives to a specific communication problems or information problems where you can improve ways that you do both access information so there are, there are ways that you can sustain your secrecy to a certain level uh, and a certain time uh, there, are, there, are, there are ways of uh, making your communication access to information anonymous which is again very important uh, so secrecy is important, anonymity is important. And as Kasia said, uh, that all leads to autonomy. If you cannot do things uh, without being observed, uh, then you don't have autonomy. And things may be decided for you if you're the political actor. So we're trying to figure out things within this realm that, that just now 
in a way happen in the, in the Western society driven by these concepts that I was talking about before. But I'd be interesting to have debate on that level. What else is possible? So it's kind of, uh, the title of this session is uh, um, Watch Your Back, which is already you know, a resistance. You have to resist something. You have to watch back, which is, which is passive, neg negative, looking back. So, just to show, uh, can I just say one story? Because you like stories, is, which is the uh, um, when you go to India, and uh, I remember because Ravi mentioned uh, had a question, and you try to ride a bike or a car. Uh, there are no lines, the, nobody respects the traffic lights, and there's like zillion of cars and vehicles of some sorts on the road. And the first thing you do as a Western, and I did, is you look at the mirrors and look at the regulations and look at the lights, and that doesn't work there, doesn't work. And then you think they need to improve it, they need to you know, imp improve this and that. But then you realize what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring your understanding of how you should understand the, the, the reality uh, and there's a metaphor there, which is, I need my system to understand this reality. And the system is different and requires different behavior. So in India, you drive basically looking forward, not backward. You look at what's happening in front of you and don't care about what's happening behind you because everybody else looks in front. So you have to have different tactics, strategies, and approach to breaking the law, rules and law, if you like, and so on. And I think what happened now with the digital sphere is that we need to develop new ways of dealing with them. That's where we are. I'd like to also pass the question to you as to how far you feel this has uh, been a game changer. And we've heard a lot about, of course, the situation in Germany and, and the laws it be. But uh, that point that Gillian raised, you know, how much can we expect from a policy level and how much is it really up to the individual to change their digital game as well? Well, I assume what we're talking about is a twofold strategy in coping with, with what we see. Um, what surely helped with the Snowden revelations was that there is now, at least amongst those interested in democracy, and this is fundamentally a crisis of democracy and not about technology or, or the internet, is that these people see the change that technology brought about in that, of course, there had always been surveillance, but the data points, even if you look into the Stasi file in East Germany, the data points had been few and far apart. And so the granularity of the picture on the individual was pretty coarse. And the amount of data that is now being collected allows, for a number of reasons, to have more precision in this picture and to segment groups in society, what we call the long tail in, in marketing or in Industry 4.0 and, and the other buzzword bingo games is that with the amount of data and data processing capabilities that now exists, things can be tailored to the individual, which might be okay with regards to, to industry or consumerism, but that brings about changes in what the state can also know about us. And this is what the, what the pushback needs to be. And I think people now understand fundamentally that this is on a number of levels, reflecting the political power structure in the world, and that this is something where they have no utility or autonomy to act against, or very little in specific aspects. So with regards to digital self-defense, as a number of other panelists have said, of course there's things that we call privacy-enhancing technologies. So there's instruments like cryptography or software that anonymizes your communication patterns and that breaks the process that intelligence agencies or data processes for industry uh, do. And the process is usually you have the raw data, you'll have information, and you distill what they grandly and boldly call intelligence. And uh, you can break any of these steps by technological means, but only to a certain extent, and it raises cost. And you can always raise cost for the attacker, but it will raise your own cost. And that's something that people now understand, that it raises the cost of what to do. So in Germany, we'll have a major debate at the moment of creating a national internet, which is a majorly stupid idea on a number of levels, first and foremost, because it will centralize the interchange points so that it's even easier to tap in the future. But it will also raise the cost of, of operations and the cost of compliance and this 
is what we see on a number of levels, that we renationalize, that we centralize and centralize and centralize as a way of, of uh, coping with, uh, in that case, uh, large-scale attacks by the United States government and other as yet unknown intelligence agencies. But this is a cost game, a cost-benefit game, and this is what capitalism does. And I think this fails to reflect the, the capitalist system in itself narrows the possible answers to the problems that we have by seeing them with a cost-benefit analysis. And what most of you already said is that we need to push back what is happening, that we need to find a way of, of coping with surveillance and trying to protect our society against this level of surveillance because as Germany's constitutional court luckily already has said on a number of occasions, you'll need to have, as an individual, you'll need to have a personal sphere within which you are totally alone in your decision-making and decision-making capability and in informing yourself about what you want to decide upon to have a functioning democratic society. And I think this is the, the core aspect that we should be talking about. So I'm really glad you said that because we had a situation yesterday. And I'm just going to take the liberty to cite this, but without names. We had a closed shop, and it was really an expert room, and all the people in the room were either coming from our government or coming from different civil society organizations and had a high level of understanding what we were talking about. And there was a kind of a basic point in the conversation where uh, I, I said that, you know, there cannot be a democracy if there is mass surveillance. And, and somebody in the room was like, but, but why? And, um, and, you know, I think more of what we're doing here is not so much just educating people about digital technologies and online security, but raising questions and trying to create a un basic understanding for democracy and how it functions. And to get, like, to that larger picture that you raised, that there is something overwhelming in trying to fight back such an unleashed, a fundamentally undemocratic system that we're facing with the small and underfunded democratic means of resistance that we're using. That's not really a question statement. Can you pass the mic anyway? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> well, it's, it's a good starting point. I mean, democracy is a good starting point to consider whether we can effectively fight surveillance with other people because, you know, especially after the last six months, I have a very strong feeling that people want surveillance. And of course, we can keep saying they won't because they don't understand, but Marek is right to say that, well, who are we to make them get our, I mean, accept our arguments as better? Uh, of course, we keep trying, and I keep trying to explain to people what really makes, uh, what difference really makes uh, the fact that somebody can control their data and use their data against them, but still, especially confronting uh, very young people like teenagers and, and younger, I see we live in completely different world in terms of what I see as being control and uh, the mere fact that I see control as something negative and they see control as something that brings them to feeling of security, coziness, uh, you know, like they are maybe too afraid of life uh, if how it would be if they had no control or nobody had control over them. So we might end up having this reflection that we live in a very different world and that we have a big part of society simply choosing, actively choosing surveillance. Here I mean mostly corporate surveillance, uh, which we spoke about before, but also state surveillance uh, based on the belief that we have democratic states and these states are here for us. When I ask questions to young people, uh, you know, how they feel about, uh, for example, Polish state integrating information about them building new databases, they ask me a question, but you know, what, what problem do you see in state that helps me uh, having more information about me? What problem you see with that? So you have to, you know, walk backwards, long, long way to explain to people how we, I mean, from where we take the mistrust from the state, the limited uh, trust approach to corporations, uh, the kind of control, uh, control, uh, well, the fact that we simply don't like control. I do think we are minority and we have to uh, somehow work with that fact forward. So uh, again, my solution would be to secure 
exit ways for us as minority as a first step. We will not convince the majority to think the way we think, but we can maybe, as being this uh, now a suppressed minority, force the state to some extent to let us do things the way we want to do them, right? So maybe this is the only realistic, realistic scenario for next years, and only when we as minority have strong rights, when we feel we are not so much under surveillance, we can build alternatives and offer them to, to the rest of the people. And again, it won't be that easy that people give up with Facebook one day and they all move to our networks like Diaspora. We will probably have to offer them some kind of interface to be in between. And this is a big question for the tech community and, and you guys, because I'm not one of, of, of you on that point. I don't know these things, but I would really like to know to what extent this is feasible way of thinking about technology, building some kind of bridges between surveilled, fully controlled technology and the one that offers some exits. Is there any, anything in between? or this is all a uh, flawed idea? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I just, I want to add to that too, because, and, and especially now that I know that Geraldine loves stories. Um, another conversation that was happening yesterday during the closed period of the event was we did this little exercise where you took your wallet and your phone and you handed it to the person to your right or to your left, and you traded with them, and so you had the opportunity to look through someone's phone or someone's wallet. And afterwards, we were asked, how did you feel? How did that make you feel? And I thought, you know, I felt nothing because the person to my right is someone that I trust and this is a really open-minded room of people and nobody's going to run away with it. And the problem there, fundamentally, is that the word privacy doesn't resonate with everyone. And this is what I'm finding in my work, is that when we talk about privacy, it's such an abstract concept and it's, it's a concept that has different meanings contextually in different cultures. And for me, I don't really personally, and I'm not saying I have nothing to hide, don't get me wrong, um, but, but I personally don't feel strongly about keeping my personal life private, for example, except the, the reason that I feel strongly about keeping, or the reason that people feel strongly about keeping, for example, um, details about their sexuality or their medical records or what have you, private is because there's an actual threat posed to them. And so when I think about surveillance, I'm thinking about the threats that it poses to my network, the threats that it poses to my right to associate, my right to express myself. And so yes, privacy is a thing, of course, whatever happened to it. But at the same time, I think we also need to start reframing things and getting to people where they understand it. Because if you understand that your network could be put under threat or that you could be put under threat for people that you are in contact with, that drives it home. Oh, that's actually a nice point to make. I can take it from there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so the question I would like to ask everybody here would be, um, uh, is that the case that you all don't care about being uh, public with your privacy, if you like, uh, really? It, um, because that's a, based on a certain assumption that I would like to question as an experiment, thought experiment, if you like, uh, was the assumption that democracy is uh, directly associated with ethics, ethical behavior and morality. And uh, when you look at um, the democratic systems that are the leading democratic systems, if you like, those who operate drones in Somalia, Yemen and, and Pakistan, uh, those are uh, democratically driven institutions that are making decisions of uh, kill people outside of any law uh, that is either war law or uh, civil law or human rights or whatever declaration and so on. Like nothing matters as long as they want to do that. And that's democracy uh, that is doing that. So um, I'm not saying that this is an example of a democracy that is unethical. I'm just saying that democracy doesn't guarantee uh, morality of any kind. A majority, majority cannot decide for the minority. And if you are in a minority, uh, and you may be at some point, even if you don't want to, because you may have some mental problems, for example, or whatever, or you change your mind about things, um, then you uh, become a problem for the majority, and you need to be uh, treated uh, so the majority can uh, go on with the business as as usual. So, so for me, the, the concept that uh, we have a potential here for the ideal system that would be good for everybody is wrong. And there's no system, and it has not been a system, political system, if you like, or religious system of any kind in the history of humanity that would be good for everybody. And you always in that, uh, that sounds like a some sort of lecture now. 
um, I'm becoming boring with age, so I shut up here. But I think uh, uh, you got the point. I think it's, uh, it's boring to talk about democracy as the ideal system, which is not, and it's proven. And privacy is because of that extremely important because you need to come up with other ideas than that. And if you don't have a space to do that freely outside of existing frameworks, then you won't be able to do that full on. I'm going to make this even harder for you to reply to. In the context that you have just des described, democracy is merely a label because, you know, can a system like that be justified or legitimized just by people voting every four years when in the meantime it disrespects its own national and other international laws and the rights of the, its people? You know, it's just a word then, right? So where's the vision that we're looking at and, you know, the direction that we actually want things to go? Andreas. Um, yeah, um, where do I start? So I think one of the aspects that I would like to raise is that it's easy to ignore the existence of norms if you conform to them, and that's something that we need to convey to those people who see no need in questioning the ever-tightening framework around them because they still conform to, to what there is. Um, that having said, uh, with regards to to the state and and democracy, Henry of Brecton famously said, "Non rex facit legem, sed lex facit regem." Not the king makes the law, but the law makes the king. But that only holds true for Western democratic societies, and we should always also think about other states. And for instance, what is called lawful interception is the technical and policy term for surveillance, for communication surveillance. And that brings across the notion of having due process before an intercept happens. But if the king were to make the law, such as in the Arab world, as we've seen, then this king can decree, I am the law, I want to eavesdrop on everyone, then this is still lawful interception. And the difference between a democratic society modeled after a Western state in this picture that I'm trying to paint and a totalitarian or authoritarian state is a configuration file because the fucking hardware is exactly the same because it's shipped and sold by Western companies. So I hope that we're talking about export control in, in, this, uh, in this conference for a little at least. Um, furthermore, what I'd like to add is the panel was about watching your back and watching, watching back. Um, I think what we need to see is that there's two things to do, one is defensive, one is offensive. The defensive part is how do we raise the cost for others because it's at the moment, as I've said, mostly a financial aspect that we're playing against them by using cryptography, by using privacy enhancing technologies and educating our peers and educating our peers about the data shadow that they carry around with them. As I've said, the data points are no longer few and far apart because the amount of data that can be stored uh, is ever increasing and the amount that can be processed. The offensive part, uh, and I've heard that John Gutz is going to be on, on here in a few moments, um, is watching back. So he's, a he's mostly the investigative journalist we currently have in this country, uh, which was instrumental in, for instance, documenting the rendition flights, uh, which is the term given to hijacking people and flying them to torture prisons. And the interesting thing is it, it cuts both ways. The amount of data collected and the availability, as we've seen in the, in the beginning with the website that the Wochenzeitung created, is that because data are co collected and stored indefinitely and there are access mechanisms, you're also able to find intelligence agencies and find the torturers because they live under the same regimes. They know better with regards to their defensive capabilities, what they call operational security, but nonetheless, if there were someone to watch back, and there's too few people, for, for my taste, watching back, then it's fairly easy to point out what's happening. And then you can make a concrete example and nail them because it's so abstract to see it will raise the cost of your health insurance if your consumption pattern with regards to chocolate is collected and analyzed in 35 years' time from now on. But it's pretty concrete if you can show that people are being dragged to torture prisons. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes left of the session. I definitely want to save time to take your questions as well. So I think we're going to start doing that right now. And comments and visions for the future too. In fact, please, you can start. 
Um, so I'm, I'm a journalist and I write an awful lot about this sort of stuff and I've considered doing the, 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 the whole kind of trying to wean myself off all American technology for a week and see if that works and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's obviously, it just, it just plainly will not work because there aren't the alternatives. How do we stimulate the alternatives built in Europe or whatever that are beautiful, that, oh God, <laughs> that beautiful, um, that are beautiful, you know, wh where is the Johnny Ive of the, 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 the open source and security world who will create something that people just want to use because they want to use it, not because it promises privacy, etc. How do we catalyze that? How do we stimulate that? Yeah, I'm just going to add a, f a quick first answer before I let the, the Europeans take the, the real strong answers on that one. But I, I just want to give one word of caution there, which is that if we're going to create alternatives in Europe, then we have to fix European laws first. Because right now, you've got no intermediary liability protections in most of these countries. You've got no, uh, I mean, not, not very strong privacy protections. And so, I mean, I'm not saying, please, by all means, like, I want to get off Google too. <laughs> Sure, and, I'm, what, and I guess my part of this response before I pass it along is that that's a big, big, huge part of it is ensuring that those protections exist so that there's incentive for companies or, or nonprofit organizations or whatever to move here and keep data here. But right now, I don't, it's hard for me to see that incentive when there's a lot of other things that, that at risk here, including censorship. Well, from what I know, we have far better privacy standards in Europe, which is exactly why so many excellent services developed outside of Europe, because it was easier and cheaper to build them on a huge scale. Uh, so, yeah, we can start with, um, you know, making the same standard for everybody, the same legal standard, so that we will make uh, Google and Facebook business model more difficult, and then maybe they will start slightly losing to the competition we want to create. But that's just a hope, because they, when they have grown so much and they are so wealthy, have so many, so many lawyers uh, waiting there to adjust terms and conditions <laughs> to new challenges, that it might not, might not be a working scenario. I don't know how we build alternatives. This is what you guys should know better than me, but uh, I know one thing. You, we will never have alternatives that are as comfortable, as nicely designed, as quick and, uh, and, and easy to use uh, as what we have in the mainstream, in the surveillance uh, market. So first we have to explain to people why they should give up some of the comfort and, 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 and the luxury of, of, of interfaces uh, and maybe some of the networks to get something more, to get something which is a different value. I do think we have to start, uh, well, call it education or something else, but with explaining what is the other value that we will never get in, in commercialized, uh, you know, cloud, uh, but we can get in decentralized uh, solutions that will never work probably that excellent or not yet. It will take them years to get to that level, but the first mile will be difficult for us, but we have to go there anyway. Yeah, as, I, as I understood your question, what you're saying is that you would like to be a critical, effective activist that is able to challenge uh, powers, and you want up for that. Um, that's not going to work. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I think you need to figure out many other things uh, to be able to do that and kind of work, and it's not about application or technology for that sake uh, whatsoever. And if you really are a questioning an authority, then uh, they won't be up for that, frankly speaking. So uh, the alternatives, as I said, for certain ways of doing communication and so on, they're based on, on the very you know, straightforward principles of open source, free software, and so on. And it's out there. And does it have to be simple and easy for everybody? Um, I'm not so sure if it should. You know, it's like if you're entering a space where uh, you're required to speak another language and uh, behave differently because that's how the space is, uh, then you need to learn that. And you can be a colonizer who comes in with your own Googles and uh, other tools and so on, but you're never going to use this space properly anyway. So that's a metaphor for, for you. Yeah, I kind of would like to disagree a little for... I, I understood the, the question that you had. Why has there not been a productized means for consumers to get privacy? And I think the answer is that first we have states that mandate rules. As Gillian rightly pointed out, as long 
as you have to be compliant to laws stipulating that everybody needs to be capable of being surveyed simultaneously by a number of actors without them knowing about each other surveying said individual, it's going to be hard as a company because you can't ignore the law on the, the uh, jurisdiction that you're living under. What we saw with Snowden's revelations is that Google and Microsoft and all the others, of course, have to comply to requests by the United States government. Um, which is a little add-on, um, I would like to say the, the main factor that we should also address is that there shouldn't be secret courts and secret laws. This is so Kafka, I can't believe it. Um, <laughs> the, the second aspect of your question is, uh, with regards to, to the productization, if there is a market, there will be a product, but I think first people need to understand that they have costs associated with surveillance, for instance, due to economic warfare, and that they need to pay a premium, because currently most services you use are free financially because you're paying with your data. And as long as people don't understand that if you're not paying for it, you're not the consumer, but the product being sold, then it's hard to monetize on this and there's no market. Thanks, we have three more questions. Sandra? Well, I don't have a question, but, but I also wanted to answer on that because I str try to strongly disagree with uh, what uh, the first two um, people said on the panel. Well, we have to be more optimistic about that. Well, we have now the first time that there is the need for this kind of software designed by the next John Ive or somebody else. Um, and before the Snowden revelations, there was not really the market. So now there are the first apps really being developed. There are the first really crowdfundings, everything um, to try to establish that the first time. So I mean, it's really going too slowly, but we have to make everything um, to support that, like um, Threema or other messengers that try to circumvent WhatsApp. And another point is, well, in the whole copyright debate, there are so many services circumventing copyright um, that are so easy to use, like uh, watch online for series of, or movies or anything, and it's outside the law. And there are not yet so many services circumventing privacy uh, that are so easy to use as uh, these platforms. Um, but there might be, and then they might be able to circumvent also the state surveillance uh, on them or the compliancy. Thank you, Sandra. Raise of hope. Should we not, do you want to say that? There's a short answer to that because uh, part of the answer I gave before is the focus on the digital aspect of security and, and privacy is uh, part of the picture. And I think what we work on is looking at it more holistically, where when you make decisions, how you're going to use certain applications, they also have a physical aspect and psychological aspect. And you, uh, f that's how you function as a human being. So um, when you, you can have the most fantastic digital tool, but if you have to use it under pressure and, and you are already under threat uh, and so on, then you would use it differently. And uh, it may put you at different risk than the digital risk, if you like which will be equally bad for you and so on. So I think it's a, that's a much more complex issue that uh, you can't uh, only address from the technical point of view. That was my point. And I think we agree here on that. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, I want to add some um, less optimistic thing. I mean like um, two things. One is I don't agree that um, it's not possible to, I don't know. I don't agree that, that we have just uh, a tool or, or like uh, a piece of software we, we need to have or to, uh, that's designed to have uh, privacy is a completely stupid idea. Because what you basically have in the moment is it's really fucked up and it's really we didn't even hit the ground in the moment because we don't know what's broken. And as long as we don't know what's broken, we cannot fix it because we not know what to fix. And that's the basic thing. And in the moment we are in a really, really bad situation that we only can you know, like rely on things where we don't even know where to start with trust. The other thing is, um, uh, many of the, of the very effective um, um, things which are um, tied to, to, to encryption, for example, OTR is just, just cypherpunks. So it's not about having 
Now we need technology which is not tied to any sort of like company or whatever, so that that you know like just do it, you know, just do Bitcoin, just to yeah, you know, and everything which has to do with it, like experimenting with stuff um, for the time where we get an idea of what we really need to fix. And still, as I said, uh, in the moment we have, or oh, the good thing is that we have a little bit of time because in the moment we cannot do much anyways. So what we can do is like taking the time to analyze um, and getting the idea what regulations we need to uh, find out about insecurities and vulnerabilities in our society and our, uh, our technology first and not starting with some, you know, like fancy app or something like that. Hi, um, it's a kind of a meta, meta question um, to say that. Um, okay, we've heard um, from more than one person uh, at the podium that um, the surveillance sucks principally because, because um, it restrains our autonomy and we cannot act autonomous. So I just, I was just wondering, this wasn't the case during this discussion, but it was kind of extreme the case during the last panel how do you feel about being at a conference called Whatever Happened to Privacy and having the Audi audience filmed by these big fat cameras? From an organizational perspective, I can answer that question by saying that in the morning I announced that we'd be filming, streaming and taking pictures because it's a public event and we've all agreed here to be here as a public audience, both the speakers as well as uh, the people in the uh, room. Um, so I don't see a conflict in that necessarily. Would you... Yeah, no, I mean, privacy, the, the issue with surveillance is that it's not with your consent. And this is with your consent. And I mean, perhaps if you came in late, perhaps you did not hear the announcement, and I understand that, but I don't see a conflict at all. I will advocate for explicit consent, so I would argue against that you consented. No, you haven't consented, you didn't have a choice. But, uh, I mean, yes, there is a difference between private and public event, and that one is public, although I do agree that there might be an issue in all the recordings and, and, and everything getting to internet, because it's yet another thing, be here, here and now, and having that online. Therefore, for me, the best practice would be to enable people not to be filmed uh, as a role, yeah, like have a separate audience and stuff like that. I'd love to add to this because it's a great point. The question is what can we do about regaining our privacy and we'll need to also understand that some of it is lost forever because otherwise the only option would be not to partake in, in society and activities and that's a major drama that I don't know how to address. Thanks. Final question. Okay. Um Thanks a lot for this really interesting debate and especially I like that you do come from different perspectives and don't all necessarily share the same uh, opinion, so that's good. I, was, I have a bit of a comment and also a question. Um, I actually noticed that we talk a lot about marketplace. I mean, so obviously uh, now because of Snowden, there is a market for more open source and so on. And I, I do feel a bit uncomfortable with that because uh, somehow we are buying into a, a logic that in a sense we also criticize or kind of don't want. So I, I, maybe you could reflect on that. But the other thing is, um, there was a comment from the, I think from the Indian guy, that uh, somehow maybe we in the Western world have taken democracy too much for granted. And uh, I do think that, I mean, I actually fully agree because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in West Germany. I, yeah. So I never have experienced a sense of surveillance that has happened in Eastern Germany. Um, but of course, for me, I think democracy is not something for granted, but something I have to fight for and to take a risk for also. And I think Snowden is a person who took a risk and the 4,000 other people didn't that work with him. So maybe you could expand on the notion of risk and risk taking and what, how can, because I don't think it's a technological issue. I think it's much more fundamentally human issue and risk taking is part of that. So maybe you could expand on that. Thanks. Maybe if all of you would like to answer, yes, okay, time for pause. Um, then uh, you can also use this as your closing statements. 
So that's not going to be, that's not going to be closing statement, by the way, so don't take a note of it. And uh, uh, risk is a very, you did, we should have a, a drink around that, I think, and talk about that. It's a more philosoph a philosophical question for me than anything else. It's a personal choice. Do you want to know what the hell you're doing here and, and, and why and what for, with whom and so on? And if you do so, then you need to figure it out and you have to be free to be able to do that. That's, that's the answer I would give you. And, and yeah, we can talk about democracy <laughs> another time. Well, nothing to add, but uh, no, you, you brought an important uh, question, which is a market, if I got you right. And uh, yeah, of course, I mean, I, I cannot agree more that surveillance, the way we see it now, both corporate and state, uh, is just part of capitalism. And if we could change that system, and if, if, we, can, if, if, if we could change the people so they, don't, so are, not, so they are not driven mostly by you know, consumerist uh, needs and uh, they need to be together because they are so lonely in the system that they created that they need to be together in a digital way so they share more data and so on and so forth, then we could find uh, the best way out. But I'm afraid that's even more difficult process of transition than the one we've been discussing before. But yes, I, I do agree that surveillance is inherently connected with market mechanisms and, uh, and the socioeconomic system we live in. So we should definitely see this as part of, uh, of the whole package and probably, uh, I mean, most preferably not use the same tools that the market uses to control us if we want to get out. So uh, to, to address the question of risk, and also I guess I should apologize because I feel like I was rude with my last response, right? Like, of course, it's fine that there are cameras, but I think what was going through my head when I said that was exactly the point of risk, where if we don't start speaking up more, if we don't take those risks and say what we really mean and say what we want for the future, then what next? Um, we can't keep being complacent about this, about surveillance, about censorship anywhere in the world. Um, and I think that, you know, while Edward Snowden took a huge and ultimate and incredibly brave risk, all of us can take small, medium risks um, every day on this. And I think that that's really important. We have to keep speaking out. I think I'll leave you with thinking about whether Janis Joplin was right when she said freedom is just another word of nothing left to lose. Thank you very much. I think that's a grand closing statement for this panel. I would very much like to thank my four panelists. Thank you, Marek. Thank you, Katia. Thank you, Gillian. And thank you, Andreas. Let's have one more round of applause for this panel.